You're listening to Radio Peking. An observer's article in the Peking People's Daily Tuesday laid bare the facts about the so-called Tonking Gulf Incident. The article is entitled The Real Story of the So-Called Tonking Gulf Incident. It pointed out that the so-called Second Tonking Gulf Incident is a complete fabrication, a downright lie spread by U.S. imperialism with a view to extending the war in Indochina. It has been seen through by more and more peoples. The governments of Korea, Cuba, Albania, and Cambodia, and public opinion in many Asian and African countries have condemned the Johnson administration's despicable lie. A considerable number of Western bourgeois newspapers and journals, too, are of the view that the allegation of the U.S. government is absurd and ridiculous. Basing itself on official U.S. data, the Observer's article pointed out that the barefaced lie concocted by the Johnson administration has many loopholes. It analyzed the announcement made by U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense Arthur Sylvester at 6 p.m. August 4, Washington time, and the information given by U.S. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara at a press conference at midnight on the same day. The observer said, There is not a single definite fact in Silverstone's announcement which came seven and a half hours after the alleged attack had taken place. He gave an undetermined number of patrol torpedo boats which took part in the so-called attack. He was satisfied the attackers launched torpedoes at the U.S. ships, but was unable to say how many. His announcement even could not say how many U.S. planes from the two carriers had taken off to aid the U.S. destroyers supposedly under attack. Nor was the duration of the attack definitely given, since it was reported that the attack is believed to have lasted about three hours. Was it the lack of time? Definitely not. Could it be that Washington had received no information from the Gulf of Tonkin because of poor telecommunications? This could not have been the case either, for both the U.S. fleet and the Pentagon are equipped with the most up-to-date telecommunication facilities, and there is constant contact between them even in early times, let alone in a serious situation where U.S. ships were, as they alleged, under attack. The observer said, One is particularly surprised that although McNamara and Sylvester are both responsible officials of the same Defense Department and were talking about the same thing, yet they contradicted each other in the information they supplied. Sylvester said, the attack came at 10.30 p.m. local time. But McNamara said that it was at 9.52 p.m. the destroyers reported they were under continuous torpedo attack. Silverster held that at least two of the torpedo patrol boats were sunk and two others damaged. But according to McNamara's version, three PT boats were sunk, one at 10.15 p.m. So the time of the beginning of the attack, as given by McNamara, is 38 minutes earlier than that given by Silverster and 15 minutes before the attack on the U.S. ships even began, according to Sylvester's version, McNamara had already sunk one enemy vessel. The article asked, How is one to explain the discrepancy between the two versions given by two responsible officials of the same Pentagon? Only one explanation is possible. 
both were telling lies. While McNamara's lies exposed his subordinates, Silvester's lies exposed his superior. The article said, Despite the much vaunted claim of the Pentagon that several enemy vessels were sunk by the U.S. ships, they have so far not been able to produce even a single piece of wreckage from these alleged sunken enemy ships. The article quoted Alain Clement, correspondent of the French paper Le Monde, as saying, This blank is striking in the United States, which is used to producing a superabundance of soldiers, charts, and explanations. The article then went on to analyze what happened in Washington on August 4th, as reported by Western news agencies. According to the Pentagon, the so-called Tonkin Gulf incident occurred on the morning of August 4th. Yet before 18 hours, all was calm and quiet with the chiefs, big and small, in busy consultation. At 12 hours, U.S. President Johnson called a meeting of the National Security Council. At 13 hours, Johnson conferred with his cabinet and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Nothing happened after either meeting. It was not until 18 hours that Washington issued an announcement that two U.S. destroyers had been subjected to a second deliberate attack, and a so-called air of crisis appeared in Washington. The article said, People cannot help putting the question. If the so-called second Tonkin Gulf incident were a fact instead of a fabrication, why did the U.S. ruling circles behave as if nothing had happened after U.S. war vessels were supposedly under attack and meetings of the National Security Council had been called? If these ruling circles were not determined to fabricate something, and therefore needed time, why did they announce the news some seven to eight hours after the United States had been subjected to what they called open aggression? If it was not because the adventurers had a guilty conscience and had to think things over carefully before they committed the crime, then why was it that Johnson did not order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply till 13 to 14 hours after the United States had been subjected to so-called open aggression. The Observer's article said, It is very clear that the so-called second Tonkin Gulf incident was either a show staged by the U.S. Navy in accordance with a preset plan of the Washington authorities, or falsified information on the part of the U.S. Navy, a mistake which the Washington authorities found handy as a pretext to extend the war they had long premeditated. In either case, the Johnson administration was guilty of lying. So what Washington had to do was not to tell the truth, but to fabricate a lie and to launch aggression on the strength of this lie. Hence, it was necessary for Washington to weigh and consider more than once whether the lie was plausible and whether the adventure was worthwhile. The tense atmosphere in Washington was by no means the result of an alleged attack on U.S. war vessels. Hence, there was no tension in Washington before 18 hours on August 4th. Tension in Washington stemmed from the decision to embark on an adventure in accordance with its lie. Hence, the appearance of a so-called crisis atmosphere after 18 hours on August 4th. Johnson told a monstrous lie about U.S. warships having been under attack. 
based on this lie, he made the decision to engage in a military adventure and forced his political rival, Barry Goldwater, to agree. It was only after he had secured the support of Goldwater that he made public his adventurous plan to bomb the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. This laid bare the secret of this liar and conspirator. But Johnson has a guilty conscience, the article noted. So his arguments are lame, his steps faltering, and his words full of contradictions. As the Chinese saying goes, a thief has a guilty conscience. The more he tries to hide, the more he exposes himself. After launching the surprise attack on the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, U.S. military and administrative chiefs were fidgety day and night. According to reports of Western news agencies, McNamara was in his office in the Pentagon all night, August 4th. Johnson was awake until 3 o'clock after having delivered his midnight television statement. Why would Johnson and company throw panicky if they did not have a guilty conscience? The Observer's article pointed out that simultaneous with its decision to make a surprise attack on the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, the Johnson administration complained to the United Nations and decided to start extensive diplomatic activities in other countries to justify its piracy. Then he sent Henry Cabot Lodge, former so-called ambassador in Saigon, on a mission to persuade other countries to swallow the lie. What hustle and bustle. That does not disappear too much of a flurry. If the Johnson administration had not put out a big lie which it knew nobody would believe, why should it take such pains to send people hither and thither to defend its actions? The Deacon People's Daily Observer said, All this proves that the so-called Second Tonkin Gulf Incident was a pure fabrication from beginning to end. As time passes, more evidence will be provided to further expose this clumsy fraud. Johnson and his kind can do nothing to alter the conclusion that they are the stupidest liars, the most cowardly adventurers, and the most shameless aggressors in the world. The so-called Conking Gulf Incident, engineered by the Johnson administration, will be recorded in the history of mankind and condemned for generations to come, like the incident of the battleship Maine, created by U.S. President William McKinley in 1898. The Neo-Tel-Go incident, created by Japanese militarist Higeru Honzil in 1931, and the Reichstag fire scandal, engineered by Hitler in 1933. That was a summary of an observer's article in Tuesday's Peking People's Daily entitled The Real Story of the So-Called Tonkin Gulf Incident. You are listening to Radio Peking. A Xinhua correspondent article Monday gives the lie to the Johnson administration's tale of an attack by the Vietnam Democratic Republic on U.S. naval vessels in the Gulf of Tonkin on August 4th, and says that there have been few such international hoaxes in history. The article says, Few lies have been so brazenly told, or so promptly exploded. The article is entitled, Big U.S. Lie and Conspiracy Exploded. 
It is 4,000 words long and is divided into five parts. The article says, It is very secret that the Jersey administration has worked out a plan for a more widespread war in Indochina to retrieve its policies of aggression and war from defeat in South Vietnam and Southeast Asia. To strengthen Johnson's position in the presidential elections, to seek an outlet for the U.S. armed industry and to stimulate the U.S. economy. The plan has been revealed time and again in the war crimes of leading U.S. officials. But it came as a surprise to some that the Johnson administration should have the audacity to invent a pretext like that to start the war and do what John Foster Dulles didn't dare. That is why world public opinion was so agitated and in America itself, people would not believe the fantastic story. Now that many more details have come to light, the U.S. government's lie and conspiracy have increasingly come to light. This sordid and audacious conspiracy will be further exposed as time goes by. The first part of the article is called A Tale Made in the USA. It quickly saw the bulletin on the Tanking Gulf incident issued by U.S. Assistant Defense Secretary Arthur Sylvester at 6 p.m. Washington time on August 4th. And the chronology of the so-called second attack made public by U.S. Defense Secretary Robert McNamara at a press conference at 040 hours on August 5th. In the second part, an unusual course. The article recalls what U.S. President Johnson and his administration did on August 4th. It points out that no mention was made of the incident at Johnson's meeting with other U.S. government leaders more than two hours after the alleged fighting. Seven hours after this fighting was supposed to have started, and four hours after it was supposed to have concluded, when reporters inquired at the White House and the Defense Department about the reported incident, they still met evasions and refusal to comment. The article also notes that the way the United States finally released the story was also most unusual. The counter-attack on the U.S. destroyer, Maddox, after intruding into the territorial waters of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam on August 2nd, was announced by the Honolulu headquarters of the U.S. forces in the Pacific, not by the Pentagon. But the Honolulu headquarters said nothing about the August 4th incident, and it was the Pentagon which monopolized the publication of the news. The article says, People cannot help asking why such extraordinary and inexplicable things should have occurred after such a grave incident. The only reasonable answer is that the alleged attack was an invention pure and simple. The White House and the Pentagon worked out long ago a plan to create a pretext for an attack and the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Once preparations were complete, action was immediate. The third part of the article is subtitled An Absurd Chronology. It turns out, U.S. Assistant Defense Secretary Arthur Sylvester first released a bulletin but it is so unpresentable that Defense Secretary Robert McNamara had to come forward himself to produce a chronology. But the more details given, the more absurd McNamara's story became, and the more loopholes it contained. 
a cursory analysis of the chronology revealed that it contained a host of problems. The article points out that Nakamura attended at his August 6th press conference that with U.S. assistance and control, the South Vietnam puppet Navy had 500 motor jumps, which from time to time crossed the 17th parallel to sneak into the coastal waters of North Vietnam, and that they were very active in that area. While putting questions to McNamara on August 5th, a U.S. correspondent disclosed that on the evening of August 4th, South Vietnamese vessels were showing or taking some sort of action against North Vietnam. McNamara categorically denied this. But the connection between the movement of U.S. warships and the parking Gulf on the evening of August 4th and the activities of the vessels of the South Vietnam puppet troops is still a matter for grave suspicion. The article says, according to the chronology, at 7.40 p.m. local time, U.S. warships and scientific surface vessels, and at 9.52, an engagement took place. Fierce fighting continued for more than three hours to 1.30 on August 5th. So the whole thing lasted for nearly six hours. This was quite a full battle indeed. But anybody with a little knowledge of military science knows that torpedo boats have a high speed but a short range and that they are suited for short distance surprise attacks on hit and run tactics. How could they engage in fierce fighting with powerful U.S. destroyers for three hours on the high seas, more than 60 nautical miles offshore? That is, how lacking this senior U.S. official, the Secretary of Defense, is in elementary knowledge. And that is how ridiculous his inventions are. Secondly, if these vessels were, as alleged by Johnson, hostile vessels of the government of North Vietnam, which made a deliberate, willful, and systematic attack on U.S. vessels, why didn't they start the attack immediately after stopping the U.S. vessels, but instead paralleled their tracks and started the attack only at 9.52? That is, two hours after the U.S. vessels had discovered them, got everything ready, and even called in an escort of aircraft. Referring to the number of hostile vessels sunk, the article recalls that Sylvester said at least two were sunk, and two others damaged. While Nakamura at one time said three were sunk, but later said two. Leaving aside how many were sunk or damaged altogether, if there were at least two sunk, then why have the Americans so far failed to produce any evidence, even a third? Just how many boats did the Americans encounter? The chronology at times said vessels and at other times, said additional vessels. So Hester, for his part, said an undetermined number. Among other U.S. officials, some said four, and some said from six to ten. In fact, just how many is still a mystery. What type of boats were these? And what country did they belong to? Sylvester, in his announcement, said they were definitely North Vietnam patrol torpedo boats. But later, the chronology of McNamara had them down vaguely as unidentified hostile surface vessels. The article asks, 
Just how many attacks did the enemy vessels launch? How many torpedoes were fired? The chronology said the U.S. ships were under continuous torpedo attack. And in another passage, were again under attack. U.S. officials say a number of torpedoes were fired. And then that they were unable to say how many. The fantastic part about it is that although the two U.S. warships were under continuous torpedo attack and were fired upon by automatic weapons in a battle that raged for three hours, they remained safe and sound with no casualties whatsoever. Referring to the time and the course of the battle, the article asked, Just when did the attack take place? How long did the battle last? The statements the U.S. put out are quite contradictory. Nessimara said, The battle took place on the 1st of August, beginning at 9.52 p.m., and at 10.15, an attacking craft was sunk. But according to Assistant Secretary of Defense Sylvester, the battle had not even started at that time, and the attack came at 10.30 p.m. local time. The first part of the article quotes extensively the comments and reports of newspaper, journals, and news agencies of France, Britain, Japan, West Germany, and other countries on the Panting Gulf incident, and turns out that the news spread by the United States sounds so absurd that it has not only been refuted and denounced by world progressive opinion, but also doubted by public opinion in the West including the United States itself. The article asks, Why should the Democratic Republic of Vietnam attack U.S. vessels in international waters? This is a question that naturally pops up in the minds of all. Every time they are with this question by movement, the Western liars were at a loss. It is indeed very difficult to try and make people believe that the peace-loving Vietnam Democratic Republic has attacked the United States. The U.S. liars want to distort everything, calling day night and night day, but that will never do. In its concluding part, the article points out that the incident of the Gulf of Tonkin was premeditated by the United States. The article quotes many U.S. officials reviewed their activities and cites press comments in the United States and many other countries to show that the bombing of the coastal cities of North Vietnam is part of the U.S. plan to expand its war in South Vietnam. The people of the world have their eyes open. They will not allow themselves to be taken in by the big lie spread by the Johnson administration. World public opinion will pass stern judgment on that administration for its crimes. We have just heard a single correspondent article entitled the big U.S. lie and conspiracy exploded. And this concludes our program for this transmission. We have been listening to Radio 2